the comma, so mighty, I wanted to talk about it more. Welcome to Jen's Writing World. If you have a story to tell, you are in the right place. Let's do it one day at a time. You may remember that a few Sundays ago, we discussed four ways to use the comma. Commas are vitally important for clarity and understanding. So today, I want to talk about three more ways to use this very important punctuation mark. These are not difficult ones, but I think they are ones that people get wrong all the time. So let's get started. First is commas with interrupters or parenthetical elements. I guess maybe I need to discuss a parenthetical element, but I'm pretty sure you know exactly what it means. You have a sentence and it's flowing along and you interrupt the sentence with and another idea with a snarky comment, with a clarification, and you can put that in parentheses. But depending on how powerful the interruption is, you can also use commas. And it would look like this. Jenny smiled widely, ouch, and held out her hand to the new CEO. Okay, if you took out the ouch, that's a perfectly good sentence, but the ouch does add something to the meaning of the sentence. Jenny may be smiling, but either it's not something she likes to do or she doesn't want to smile to the new CEO. And the narrator, um, whether that's Jenny or somebody else, is noticing that there's a bit of pain in that smile. Thus, the interrupter of ouch. Now, you could put that in parentheses, which is what I normally do, but this is kind of a minor interruption. So instead of putting in parentheses and giving it a whole lot of importance, you can just put a comma before and after, and the reader will get the interruption, but it doesn't feel like the entire sentence stopped with that interruption. Pretty simple. Second, a comma with an appositive. Oh boy, here's another one of those grammar words. I think part of the problem with learning grammar and the reluctance to learn grammar is because whenever you're reading these books and learning about stuff, they, th they throw out terms like appositives and parenthetical elements and comma splice. And you're like, I don't know what those words mean. Why can't you just put it in simple English? I'd like to remind you, however, that in almost anything you do, whether it be a job or a hobby, there are words special to that occupation or that hobby. Um, if you knit, if you crochet, you know, somebody might go, what the heck is a pearl? Isn't that the thing out in the sea? But you're a knitter and you know what a pearl is. And it's part of what makes you a successful knitter is knowing the terms and their meanings. And also part of what makes you a successful writer who knows and understands grammar, which is important to being a successful writer, is that you know these terms and you may not use them all the time, but when you're editing your paper, you might go, oh yeah, there's one of those. Now you might not say, oh look, there's a parenthetical element or there's an appositive, but you know what the word means and therefore you can make the corrections. With that being said, what is an appositive? And a positive is a word or phrase that relates to a noun in a sentence. Uh, yeah, that was clear as mud, but that's okay. I have some examples. The first one is for non-essential positives. Goes like this. My sister Fran baked a cake. Or Natasha Romanoff, the Black Widow, fired three shots at the alien. My sister is the noun in that sentence. My sister baked a cake. My sister, the noun. Fran is the appositive because it relates to the noun. It describes the noun, perhaps. It elaborates. My sister um, is not overly clear. It's clear enough that you know it's my sister, but maybe you want to know who my sister is. Oh, my sister is Fran. But the sentence makes sense either way. Now, Sometimes the appositive is essential, as if you take it out and the meaning of the sentence changes. In those cases, you don't put a comma in. So it's kind of like if you can remove the appositive, then you put the comma in because it's kind of like saying this chunk is separate from the sentence. But if it's 
essential, as in you can't just remove it and have the sentence stay the same, then there's no commas because that can't be removed. Here's an example of essential appositives and no commas. My sister Fran stood at the stove cooking as my other two sisters walked in. And the best-selling book Jurassic Park is one of Michael Crichton's best books. Okay, now in that first sentence we still have Fran, but in this case I have three sisters. If I don't put the Fran in, you wouldn't know which of my three sisters was standing at the stove. Therefore, the Fran is an essential appositive, whereas above, the assumption is I only have one sister and it's non-essential. Michael Crichton wrote a lot of best-selling books. If you think Jurassic Park is his best best-selling book, you better put that name in there because if you took it out, uh, yeah, the reader's going to wonder which best-selling book. So, pos positives can be essential, they can be non-essential. If they are not essential, they get the commas. If they are essential, they don't get the commas. And what are appositives? They are words or phrases that are related to the noun of the sentence. Simple. A third way to use commas is to separate dates. This one gets messy. And you may not write a lot of dates in your writing, um, but certainly if you have to write formal um, information or invitations, uh, yeah, a lot of dates floating around. And there's two things you need to remember when using commas. And the first one is this. If you are writing day, month, date, which is how we do it in the United States, just so you know, we don't say 31st, 31 December, we say December 31. But so this is for Americans. If you are writing day, month, date, you put a comma between the day and the month. And here is an example. The surprise party will be on Saturday, January 14th at Jason's house. So there you will notice that there is a comma between Saturday and January. You will also notice that there is a comma after the 14th, and that is because you always put commas after dates. They are an item that you want to have separated out. They have importance. Um, we separate them out with commas, but Saturday, comma, January, always. Okay. Now what happens if we add the year to this? So now you have month, day, year. You're still going to put the comma at the end if it's in the middle of or the beginning of a sentence, but you're also going to put a comma before the year. And it looks like this. On July 4th, 2021, the fireworks will start at 9 p.m. Pretty clear, right? You have the month, you have the date, comma, the year. Now, if you ever write checks or anything like that, I know that antiquated thing called a check, that's how you write it. We write month, day, comma, year all the time. The trick is we sometimes forget to add those commas when we put it in writing, when we put it in a paragraph, when we put it in dialogue, um, when we write it on an invitation. So all those things, oh, um, emails, things like that. Certainly you do the comma. And a lot of this is for clarity. You know, it makes it understandable to have the comma there. Now, sometimes those commas can just get messy. And that happens when you have these combined. You have the day, you have the month, the date, and the year. Here we go. I'm visiting Disney World starting Monday, September 19th, 2022, for an entire week. All right. So rule number one is we put a comma between the day and the month. We got that. And rule number two is we put a comma between the date and the year, which we did. And rule number three is we put a comma after the year because we are separating that date out from the rest of the sentence. Uh, pretty simple, right? Yeah. That's a lot of commas to remember. So the best thing you can do with this is just that when you are writing, uh, if you're not sure, look it up. And that moves on to our next part. I only have three uh, grammar rules for commas today. Uh, and actually we won't be discussing commas anymore. I will be moving on to other fascinating punctuation. But I wanted to give you a little bit of advice. You're probably not going to remember what you hear on a YouTube video or even maybe what you see on the page when you're studying it um, in a textbook or anything like that. So now you're separate from all of that learning and you're writing and like I said, first drafts, don't worry about it. Write whatever you want. But when you go back to edit, you do need to know. 
Now, you can do things like pay for Grammarly or Pro Writing Aid or any of the marvelous editing software programs out there, and they will point out commas for you, point out comma splices, point out all the corrections. Um, but maybe you don't have those things. Maybe you don't want to put the money out for them. Maybe you're on somebody else's computer and you can't access it. Here's my advice. If you're not sure you have that comma in the right place, just Google it. It's really easy. You can literally like ask it the question and say, does a comma go after the year? And Google will come up and say, yes, a comma goes after the year in a sentence. Okay. And you're like, oh, great. Thanks, Google. So not knowing the answer nowadays is not the answer. Being bad at grammar is not an excuse anymore because even if you don't have any of the wonderful editing programs out there, you probably have Google or your version of a search engine, in which case you can say, huh, I wonder if I'm supposed to separate out Fran in that sentence. And so you can type it in and you don't have to know what in a positive is. You can simply say, when I have this and this and literally like type your sentence in and say, is this right? Google will bring it up and I guarantee you it'll probably say something like, and a positive that is non-essential gets commas and a positive that is essential does not get commas. Pretty simple. And I'm only harping on this because you still see a lot of bad grammar in the world. And I think that when we were kids, at least when I was a kid, it would have been back in the 80s, and you had to have the grammar book on your desk, it could be easy to say, well, I didn't have a grammar book and there was no way, you know, or I'd already typed it on the typewriter and I didn't want to go back and use the whiteout and blah, blah, blah. But that's not true nowadays. I mean, heck, even Word itself has a small grammar check. The little blue squiggly lines means you probably did something wrong. Right click, find out what it says. Now, it's not comprehensive, so that's how come I love to use Grammarly, not a sponsor. But I do try to use an editing program to kind of help me through the weeds and make sure that at least the basics are correct. Do I get it right 100% of the time? No, I don't. Do I ask Google a lot of questions? Yes, I do. One more bit of advice, also not a sponsor, but I highly recommend that you listen to the Grammar Girl podcast. And if you're not listening to her podcast, at least read her articles online. Because when it comes to grammar, she is the master. And her stuff is very relatable and very readable and very entertaining. And she has books. So you can have an ebook on your phone that is like all about grammar. So you don't have an excuse if you don't have the tome on your desk. Um, and it's a really good um, way to do it. As a matter of fact, if when I Google um, my questions, if Grammar Girl is one of the choices, it is what I will click on first because I know I'm going to get accurate answers to my grammar questions and I will understand what she is writing because she makes it very accessible. So, all right, enough of the advice. Learn the commas, learn what you don't know, Google it, find the answers, become a better writer. I think that's all I have to say on that. All right, join me on Tuesday and we will do another write-in to 25-minute sessions. I hope you've been enjoying those. I have to say, compared to the 10-minute sessions, I am getting so much done. I hope that is true for you too. If you would like to see all of my videos, you can hit the subscribe button down below. A like is always appreciated, and I would love it if you would share this video and others with your writing friends. Today's quote is by Dave Barry. Uh, if you don't know who Dave Barry is, where have you been? His columns for the Miami Herald are so funny. I love to listen to his um, books on audio. He reads many of them and they're just simply brilliant. And when you just need something to take your mind off the world, uh, yeah, his books are the way to do it. And this is what he said. You write every day. You make it a point of sitting down and writing, even when you have absolutely nothing in your mind to write. The act of sitting and trying to produce something is really important. Oh yes, I hope you believe that. Um, if you sit down in your chair and you start typing, it doesn't matter whether the grammar is good or bad, ideas will begin to flow. So long from Jen's writing world. Until we meet again, write, write, write. Thank you.